Remember me? I'm Al Lawless. I'm an instructor here at the National Test Pilot School. Today's lesson is all about lift, how an airplane creates it and how we can change it. If an airplane is going to fly anywhere in the atmosphere, it's going to have to create enough lift to exactly compensate for its weight. In a nutshell, we can do this with Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. To illustrate Newton's third law, I can use this flat plate and some sort of flow that we can see. For that, we're going to use some water. To provide the water, we've enlisted the help of the Mojave Airport Fire Department. If you will. Okay, we have a stream of water here, and I can deflect that stream with my plate. Now, as the plate pushes the water down, Newton's third law says that the water pushes the plate up, and it's giving me lift. I'm trying to lift the plate, and I have to force it down. Now, we can play a couple of games with that. One is, I can change the angle of attack of the plate to increase the lift. And the other thing is, I can change the flow, the speed of the flow and its momentum. Now, if I increase it a little bit, I get more lift. A lot more lift. If we really increase it, there is some huge, huge lift going on here. <laughs> Newton's second law is F equals ma, where a is acceleration, the rate of change of velocity. In other words, acceleration is how quickly the velocity changes. Incorporating this into Newton's second law, we can rewrite it as force equals mass times the velocity change per time change. Now, since we know that mass times velocity is momentum, then the second law can also be shown as force equals the final momentum minus the initial momentum, all divided by the time it takes for that to happen. Or basically, the force is the rate of change in momentum. Everything that affects the total force on a wing is shown right here. The pieces of the equation are some force, F, the initial momentum of the air, mass times initial velocity, the final momentum of the air, mass times final velocity, and the time it takes for that momentum to change. Let's determine how we can change the force by playing with each of those parameters, starting with the initial momentum. Consider a ball of air traveling along a streamline before it encounters the plane. This ball has a certain volume, V, and we can choose any size volume we like, so let's simplify things and follow the size of one. More balls are involved as the size of the plate increases. You can look at this along the chord C of the plate or along the span B of the plate. What we see is that the number of air balls is directly related to the area of the plate. This area is given the abbreviation S and is easy to calculate for a rectangular plate. Area equals span times chord. For now, let's just look at one of those balls. The air in this ball has a certain density, rho. The mass of the ball is the density times the volume, but since the volume is size 1, well in that case, the mass equals the density. At first, this ball of air is traveling along with some initial momentum. The size of the arrow shows the direction and speed of the flow. As the air hits the plate, it can't go through, so it slides down alongside it. This is a change in the flow's direction as shown. We can break this new velocity into two components, one along the original direction and one perpendicular to it. Notice that the new component along the original direction is shorter, meaning the horizontal speed is lower than it was initially. There's also a new vertical velocity that did not originally exist. Because today's subject is lift, let's talk about the change in vertical momentum of the air. Now, as the air comes in initially, it has no vertical velocity, therefore it has no vertical momentum. But as it hits the wing and goes down, it gets some vertical momentum. Now, the change in vertical momentum is simply the mass of the air times that new vertical velocity. This whole process takes a certain amount of time, delta t. Now, from Newton's law, what we see is that the shorter the time is, the smaller the delta t, the greater the resulting force is. For our case of looking at the change in vertical momentum, the lift of the ball is the density times the vertical velocity divided by the change in time. 
If there's more than one ball of air involved, then we would add up the lift for each one of them. The lift of the entire plate is density times the vertical velocity divided by the time times the number of balls of air. We now have everything needed to look at generating a lift force on a wing. Four factors are the density of the flow, the vertical velocity given to it, how quickly it happens, and the wing area. Let's demonstrate these effects one at a time. Well, I'm sure most of you at one time or another in your life have stuck your hand outside the window of a car while you're driving on down the road, and you can feel how the change in airflow affects the lift on your hand. Well, we're going to demonstrate that same idea with the airplane, and this time, instead of driving down the road, we're going to use the propeller to generate some wind speed and demonstrate the effects. Clear prop! <laughs> I'm using the propeller to create a big slipstream at big velocity past the fuselage. And just like you stick your hand out a car window, here I go with my hand outside the fuselage. Now, as I increase the angle of my hand, the angle of attack, it deflects the air downwards faster and faster, creating more momentum. Change of momentum causes my hand to lift. As I increase the angle of attack, I get more lift in my hand. You may have seen this in an air show where the performer suddenly increases the angle of attack to increase the lift and begin to climb. All right, now we're going to demonstrate the next idea, changing the velocity. If the air is falling fast, then it moves from the initial condition to the final condition very quickly, and the time change, delta T, is small. Of course, the opposite is true when the airspeed is low, the transition time is longer. I'm going to start off with my hand at the same angle of attack as before, and now I'm going to increase the velocity of the air through the propeller by increasing the power. Now with this higher power setting, I'm getting a lot more lift off my hand. I have to push it down more. And just the opposite is true if I go to idle power. And now at idle power, there's a lot less lift and my hand doesn't get nearly so much momentum. Now we've talked about the idea of airspeed changing lift and angle of attack changing lift. We can demonstrate both together as we watch an airplane come in for a landing. Now the pilot starts off at high speed, but as he slows down for the landing, he's gonna lose lift on the wings. So to compensate, what he has to do is pull the nose up to a higher angle of attack to get just the right amount of lift out of the airplane. The pilots spend an awful lot of time practicing to get just that right amount of angle of attack so that everything works out very smoothly. Next, we're going to talk about the density of the flow. You've probably heard that as you go up in altitude, the air gets thinner. What we're really saying is that the density is going down. Now, if you look at the lift equation, as the density goes down, so does the lift. To compensate, what a pilot will do is increase the angle of attack. Now, if you want to fly all the way up at about 80,000 feet, the air density is only about 5% of that at sea level. So there's no way you can increase the angle of attack enough to compensate for the loss of lift. But if you go back to the lift equation, what you'll see is that you can also increase the airspeed. And that's exactly what the SR-71 does. At low altitude, it doesn't need to fly fast to create lift. But at high altitude, it has to fly fast to keep from falling out of the sky. Now let's look at the last of the four factors that affect lift, wing area. The lift equation shows that this is another way of achieving the desired lift on an airplane. The B-57 Canberra bomber, shown here, could not fly fast, but could carry a lot of weight because the wing area was large. When the same plane was used for high altitude spy missions, the wing couldn't lift as much because of the decreased air density. That was okay though, because it didn't need to carry a lot of weapons for spy missions. When NASA wanted to fly the B-57 even higher for research missions, the designers went back to the drawing board and came up with a really big wing. The same change in momentum principle can also be demonstrated with the water scoop. It's essentially a flat plate that pushes the water down. As the water generates an equal and opposite force, primarily in the lift direction, it will get lift. Since the density of the water is very high compared to air, you can figure that you don't really need too much area to support this weight of the scooter. On the water, a skier needs about 30 miles per hour, and a small ski to support his weight. If the skier goes up to 40 miles an hour, he can kick off the ski and just go barefoot. Not much flat plate area is needed when the density and velocity are high. 
Let's review today's discussion. We started with F equals MA and showed that the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Since today's subject is lift, what we're interested in is the change in vertical momentum. And the lift equation is density times wing area times the change in vertical velocity divided by the change in time. We played with each of the factors in that equation to show how it affected lift. Now the vertical momentum change is affected by the speed across the wing and the angle of attack on the wing. One other factor that affects it is the curvature of the wing. A flat plate doesn't change the momentum quite as much as a curved surface does. Aero engineers clump both the angle of attack effect and the curvature effect into one term called lift coefficient. We abbreviate that as CL. CL is just a measure of the effectiveness of the wing at creating lift. And it's really easy to measure in a wind tunnel. Now what we can do is we can take that CL term and add also the airspeed effect to come up with the total change in vertical momentum, which is just the CL times the velocity squared divided by 2. We take that, plug it into the lift equation to come up with the final equation, which is the lift is equal to the density times the velocity squared divided by 2 times the wing area times the CL. Now we can take all of this and plug it into our real life equation to find out different things about the airplane, such as what is the stall speed for this aircraft here. So let's go and find out right now what it is. To predict the minimum flying speed for an airplane like this chipmunk here, we need to know a few things. The wing area is 180 square feet, the weight is 2,000 pounds, and at the altitude I'm flying at right now, the air density is 0 0.002 slugs per cubic foot. The last thing is the lift ball system. From our wind tunnel studies for this shape of wing and the angle of attack that it stalls at, we find that the maximum lift coefficient, CL, is 1.76. So if I put all those numbers together, can I predict what the minimum flying speed is for this airplane? While you're calculating that, I'm going to slow down and see if I can get this baby to stall. Okay, here it goes. Airspeed is down to 50 knots, 49, 48, 47 knots, and there we go. We've stalled. So we just established by practice our actual minimum flying speed, and our job as flight testers is to compare that to what we have predicted. Well, that about does it for today. It's time to go off and have some fun. This is such a tough way to make a living.